Hey, Lydia, you got a second? Yeah, what's up? I wrote something and I want to know your thoughts on it. Sure, hit me with it. Cool. All right, here we go. Somehow, the florist realized that he was almost tricked by a simple act of mischief. Slightly bothered by how the woman cut the flower in front of him, he looked at her and said, It's really only a flower, you know. I like it, but you gotta drop those crutches. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of the Red Ink Writers podcast. My name is Sandy Butchers, and I'm the author and illustrator of the Singularian Grimoire Anthology on Kickstarter. And uh, my name is Lydia Stevens, author of the Hellfire series and the Ginger Davenport Escapades. We're happy to have you back on board today, crutches and all. Red Ink is always happy to bring you news from the Hive, so get ready for Ride Hive Lite, the free virtual writing event held in October. During this two-day event, you'll have the opportunity to connect with other writers, hone your craft, and receive expert instructions from professional editors. It's also perfect for writers who need a set time to sit down and focus on their writing or revising. You don't need a finished manuscript uh, to apply and applications uh, to join the Write Hive Lite open on August 15 and they close on the 21st. So if you want to join that, hit the link below in the description. The title for this week's episode is, as usual, another word joke. However, this one is actually more literal than you might expect. Crutches, also known as crutch words or filler words, are very common in the writing world. They distract us, they make our work appear messy and around the point. And above all, we need to learn how to drop them. This episode will spend some time giving you tips and tricks on how to recognize your own crutch words and what you could do to easily edit them out of your drafts. Now, before we dive into the meat of today's episode, I want to give you a quick reminder that hitting that like button is free and very much appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel because as you can see, about 98% of our viewers are currently not subscribed. So do help us out and hit that button, please. <laughs> Sandy, on earlier mini episodes of the Red Ink Writers podcast, you already did a feature on the author's guide to the nine circles of hell. This was about the nine most used crutches of all time. Could you give us a quick recap on what that was about? Absolutely. I did uh, one of the short episodes on the um, author's guide uh, to the nine circles of hell uh, because there are nine words absolutely notorious um, for being a crutch word or a filler word. Now, uh, I created this guide to help writers recognize these words um, and also gave them a very quick and easy way to sort of explain what these words do to the text that's actually being written. Um, so let's have a look. Now, I'm not going to read these out loud to you right now because I'll be posting them on Twitter and on the website. So do check in there once you're done watching the episode. But if you have a quick look at all these words, you'll notice that most of these are very common in spoken language, but very distracting in written language. Now, as we are both writers, I'm sure we are both very familiar with all of these words. But I'm just wondering that as an editor, Lydia, how do you deal with these words? Um... As an editor, I start to recognize people's crutch words because as I'm reading through a document, you know, they start to become repetitive. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Yours is scream. Yep. I, will give, I will give our audience that one right here. Um, when, I'm, when I'm working on one of your drafts, you know, that one stands out to me um, the most. Um, mm. In my own work and having editors for my own work, I have I keep a list um, that I have here on my on my um pegboard and those I will go through after I've written a draft and do a search all um, or find all whatever software you're using can search for those words and you can see how many is in the document and then you can go through and work on editing those taking them out or um, finding synonyms or something like that so as a writer it's a very different approach to these words as it is an editor an editor they start to just they're so repetitive um, yeah. that you start and to notice are you them. Are you shocked by how many times you find certain words? Because I remember in the writing shoes, um, when when we worked on my very first manuscript, I looked up the word, I think it was that, and mm -hmm. I found it over 1,000 times in a manuscript yep. of about 100k words. That's crazy. 
Yeah, that's actually one of my crush, uh, cr crutch words is the word that. I remember with one of my first editors, she gave me a list of like 10 or so. Um, and that one was the worst one to work on. There was like a thousand instances of the word that. And I think I got rid of about half of them. There's a way to structure a sentence so that, so that. There is a way to structure a sentence so you don't need to use that word, that. Um, <laughs> so if, if I had said it the other word, so, you know, there's a way to structure a sentence so that you don't need to use the word that mm -hmm. for that. So yeah. that's using that word the word that three times in a sentence so it is it, it can be very distracting but as you're writing you don't realize you're doing it so um that's why it's so important to keep track of when people say to you you know that word is really repetitive or um you know it's a filler word you don't really need it to be able to get the meaning of your sentence um keep track of them because it will really clean up the writing and the manuscript and make it flow so much more mm -hmm. another yeah, um, another one of my crutch words is the word but. Uh, I'd be making compound sentences all over the place and the industry right now actually likes shorter sentences that are, are fast paced. Um, so I was combining a lot of sentences and I'm so sorry my cat has decided to join us. Um, <laughs> That's okay. So, and he's scratching my butt. Um, no, he's scratching the back of my feet. So <laughs> yes. Um, definitely keep track of them and there is software out there and I can't remember the name of it I will look for it and when I find it I will post it to Twitter yep. um, which can go through and do um, an analysis of your document and tell you how many times you use specific words um, and give you uh, you know um, sort of a composition of some of those filler words that you have and how you know, a percentage of, of what, how many, compared to how many words you have, how many times yeah. you use the words. Yeah. So, yeah. That's actually really useful because I, I, I don't know that software. Like, I, I do it manually, actually, just, uh, you know, look them up. Yeah. And I, I, by now, have a list of my own uh, crutch words. Like, I know scream is, is in there. My characters are always screaming. Like, they can't talk normally. They always scream and they always cry. And I think uh, I had growl and, and uh, gnarl uh, once. and. And, and I, I also think it can uh, it can be different in every manuscript you work on. Yes. Um, it, it totally depends on uh, on the setting that you're using. But yeah, I think you know you have your your typical crutch words or filler words that you fall back on as a writer, um, and that's just to keep the words flowing. Your brain picks those up and they and they fill them in there, yeah. and then you go back and you have to correct them. But I think if you're if you're switching genres or um, you know. The point of view even maybe because yeah. you're gonna have to use a different sort of lingo that you would in first person as opposed to um, third person POV um, so that's definitely going to uh, to sort of slightly change some of those words um, yeah. but they will be in there um, yeah I, I so noticed uh, an example of what you just said like when you when you change in, in uh, POVs because I I used to write in third person and lately I've been working a lot in first person and what I realized just now, when I when I come to think of it, is that um, in my first person, <laughs> hello cat, <laughs> hello. In my first person writing, I the the concept of time is suddenly very important. So I use things like suddenly or already or uh, mm -hmm. uh, now, and and all those markers on time, they are so much more, you know, present than when I used to write in uh, third person. So th that's a very good point you you um, you point out there. Yeah, um, I think um, genre, setting, point of view, those are all great things to be aware that your crutch words are going to change. Another thing that every writer across the board needs to be aware of that are filler words, because agents and editors do want, not want them right now, are adverbs. Um, probably, likely, actually, definitely. Um, really? <laughs> Really, hugely, really? <laughs> massively. If it ends in yeah. ly, do a search all for for an ly. Um, yeah. See how many words you come up with and how many you can take out. Um, you know, cut them yeah. by half, cut them by three quarters if you if you yeah, possibly. Because should. most of them are are you know show don't tell rules anyway. Because yeah. you know I can go 
I can go quickly, but what does that quickly look like? And that, I think yeah. that sounds much more interesting than, you know, saying it, it was really quickly, really quickly. Oh, that's a duel. <laughs> yeah. So what about it is quickly? I mean, you know, describe what quickly yeah. looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great, great example of, you yeah. know, kind of trying to sneak in behind the Shoto talent rule. So I think that's definitely um, and you can do uh, an adverb list search on Google and you will get the little um, like I have printouts of them for clients and stuff and for myself just uh, common adverbs that are used mm -hmm. and you can keep those beside you know however you like to organize your yeah. your notes to yourself as you're writing um, but yeah they make a great resource to say how many times am I using the yeah. word really or actually or you know something like that so yeah. I actually, actually is a nice one as well <laughs> yes that actually I was just gonna say actually is one of my correct words it's on my list yeah. so yeah. I have to be careful with that one it's funny like the more you become aware of these or uh, now that we talk about this uh, I become so much more aware of the words that I use and it's I think it's a very good thing like everyone who is writing who is who is writing who is you know watching this episode right now think for yourself what am I using like what is a word that I remember now you know that is coming back so often because the, the word that comes to your mind right now that's probably a word that you're gonna find back like one or two thousand times over across your manuscript so the, being aware is, is a good thing well then you could also have a critique partner like me and poor Sandy I'm gonna put her on the spot again I sing to her now when she screams and and i have that i can't remember the name of the artist but i just you know all i have to do is scream <laughs> scream <laughs> scream yeah so i sing to poor sandy when i come across her word scream oh. and i don't know if she's probably sitting on the other side of the computer screaming at me <laughs> internally i'm <laughs> screaming no i'm just thinking like i should read my own guide to the nine circles of hell and actually be done with it because oh actually here we go again it's crazy like we actually, can't speak without these words it's it's insane look if we if we can't speak without them how can we write without them but you know it's yeah yeah i was just having yeah. this great conversation with my son in the car actually on the way to come do the recording and we were talking about uh words for different generations and theirs is to shorten everything. And he was telling me about the word bay, which in another language actually means poop. And I just said, it just drives me, it's one of those words, it drives me crazy. I just don't understand why you can't just say the word babe. Like, just say say, say the whole word. You're only missing one letter. But exactly. that's just, <laughs> linguistics is so cool. I took a linguistics class and it is really fascinating how words come in and out of usage and mm -hmm. which ones stick and which ones are just fads and, and eventually they go out of use. But I was telling him, you know, my generation way back when um, was whatever and the word like. We said like, oh my gosh, like yeah. the word like after like every other, oh, drives me crazy now when I hear it. But, <laughs> but there's my yep. crutch word. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's in whatever, like, and dude are the three that I remember um, the most from my youth. And then of course my darling son turns to me and he says, yeah, way back when, Mom, when you used to have disco balls at the prom, and I said, ouch, oh. not that <laughs> old child. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. <laughs> Apparently, oh, like and dude is associated with disco balls, but yes, this is my... I don't get it, though, because dude is also a surfer thing, but we are, we are going off topic. <laughs> we are, but crutch words, you know, yeah. filler words, those are the words that... Um, we're familiar with and we're comfortable yeah, with it. Um, exactly. And we actually, we pick them up from friends. Yeah. I find that um, one, say, one saying that you use a lot is yeah, but no. Um, and that is actually also a Midwestern, yeah, no. Um, I find it myself doing it a lot more lately, um, being friends with you, <laughs> working with you and stuff You're like welcome. that. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Like I said, linguistics is, is truly fascinating how we use words and, and what words become familiar. And mm -hmm. that familiarity, I think, is what's translating into the writing because we get into this space when we're writing and we're comfortable and we want the words to flow. We want the story to come out. And so as we're writing the plot along, we're just falling back on that familiarity so that we can get through the story. But what's the most important thing with crutch words is the revision afterwards. That is why revising and editing is so important and you cannot skip that process no. uh, because you are going to end up missing those filler words and mm -hmm. your story is just going to be repetitive and the way that the characters speak is just not going to resonate with a reader so it's very important to keep track of them to recognize them 
and you know embrace them because they are a part of your lingo and they're a part of your mentality when you're writing and then as you're revising say no no i like them when i'm drafting but they can't stay now yeah yeah editing is important and and, and this is definitely one of those things that has to come back in there yeah good point Red Ink has opened the door to their virtual studio for fellow writers and members of the writing community. Do you want your book promoted on the show? Or would you seize a chance to join us uh, uh, for an interview about your work? Well, we are excited to announce that this is possible. On our website, readingwriters.com, we have a continuous raffle going on where you can enter to win a free promotion or the invitation you know, to join us on the show. This week, we'd like to show you Double Jeopardy by Alan Bailey's. 12 September 1932, a failed military experiment opens a doorway to a parallel world and an ancient empire with ties to our world. 90 years later, Detective Inspector Dave Barnes is summoned to investigate a murder in the quiet English village of Langley Park. Along with his friend and colleague Andrew Jenkins, they began an investigation that uncovers some startling facts. They uncovered the evidence of corruption going not only all the way up to higher echelons of the British government, but also of a global conspiracy spanning decades. Embroiled in a fight for not only their own survival, but the fate of the world against an enemy that is oddly familiar is now also at stake. As two worlds collide, an ancient inhuman force waits in the shadows. That sounds like quite a thrill ride, so if you are interested in this book, do click the link below in the description. Hey everyone, this is the portion of the episode that is the Intern Insight. And I know that you guys didn't get the little clips this week. Um, some scheduling conflicts got in the way. So we're going to do it all right here today. And today we're going to do one topic, and that is to talk about how to write a synopsis and what the synopsis is for. So I'm also going to invite Sandy to join me a little bit in, on this. And although um, she hasn't been on the um, opposite end of the literary agency in terms of, of viewing a synopsis. She's written enough of them that, you know, I really want, I think her insight is um, invaluable. So um, first thing is, is what is the synopsis? And you'd be surprised at the people who are not quite familiar with that. Um, it's not a book blurb. It is not a query letter. It is a basically um, almost like an outline of your book, of the whole book. Um, who your main character is, who your villain is, um, what motivates your main character, and that is very light, the motivation. So remember this part because I am going to talk about it a little bit in a minute. Um, basically, it is just a retelling in one to three pages of what your whole book is about. So you need to take your character from the moment chapter one starts and the story um, from that very first moment and tell us all of the plot points that are relevant in this story until the start to the end. Now, you might be wondering, well, what am I supposed to say? The thing is, is with the synopsis, and I see this a lot, and I saw this a lot in the agencies, is they can get so tedious if you introduce way too many characters, if you try to tell us way too many of their motivations, why they're doing what they're doing. I don't need to know that that's what the book is for. I just need to know what they're doing, how they're getting to the next point, how they're gonna get, you know, so what the conflict is, um, and then how that conflict is going to be resolved. So if you wanna think of a synopsis and how to write a synopsis, think of it like a grocery list, okay? So you know you're going to the grocery store, you have no food in the house, you need stuff to eat. Each grocery store has an aisle. So you're writing your list out and you're gonna write, I need this from this aisle. So in terms of uh, synopsis, I need, you know, potatoes from the produce aisle. And that's the very first aisle that you're gonna, chapter one, I need potatoes. Chapter two, you're then gonna go on to the deli. You know, I need some cheese, something like that. So it's your plot points. You just know that the character is going to start at the bar in the beginning and then they're gonna run away from the bar because you know they got attacked by an ogre and the ogre's trying to take over the kingdom. And that is almost too much to actually put into a synopsis. However, we now know who your main character is, who your villain is, what the conflict is. So now we wanna know how they're gonna resolve that conflict and get to the end. So, okay, the next thing I need to know is what does the character do after they leave the bar? Where do they go? What do they need? How are they gonna defeat the ogre in the end? 
So that is, again, sort of a skeletal summarization of chapter one into chapter two. I don't need to know why your character needs to defeat the ogre. I don't care that he has a hate on for an ogre. Um, I just, you know, or if the ogre killed his entire family, I don't need to know that right now. Um, I just need to know that he's he's going after him. He's going to get him. So a synopsis is, like I said, it's so much like almost listing what each chapter is about in maybe one to two sentences because you only have one to three pages to accomplish that. So you can mention who your secondary characters are. You can even mention a couple of your tertiary characters, but I don't need to know what motivates them. I don't need to know their conflict unless it directly affects the main plot of the story. Don't tell me what motivates them or what their, you know, um, smaller conflicts are. Then it gets too muddied and it's like trying to wade through pea soup. You've got, you know, the character trying to get to the end with the ogre and all this other stuff swarming in around you and you're like, who is this guy? Why is he important? Why do I care? I don't, we don't. We just want to know point A to yeah. B to C. So think of it in a very linear fashion of writing a synopsis. Um, you know, I don't need all of the offshoots of what's going on over here in this kingdom and what's going on down there in that kingdom. I just need to know what happens to the main kingdom and, you know, the person kind of running that and, and where they're going to go and how they're going to get there. Um, I think that's the biggest advice I can give on how to write a synopsis. Um, I, I've seen synopses which are almost too sparse um, and I'm like, okay, they're, they're going to... Um, run away from the bar, but why? Um, and I don't necessarily need their whole backstory, I just need to know that there was an ogre that attacked them. And they kind of forgot to put that little tidbit in there. So it is possible to not have enough for the story to make sense, for the summary to make sense. So you have to be aware that one to two sentences per chapter, because you only have three pages max to get this out, um, so that it makes somewhat, you know, it tells what the story is about. Yeah. In, in a linear fashion. So, um, Sandy, do you have anything to add to that approach or? Yeah. Um, I, okay. So on Twitter, you get a lot of info and, and you get a lot, you see a lot of questions from, uh, writers about the synopsis. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I often see is people asking, what should I do if I have, um, a multi POV book? Or, you know, if halfway through the book, the book switches point of view. And I personally think um, that you should still choose one. Um, because I, I had this with Bonds of Blood and Silver, where, you know, every three chapters, basically, it switched to another character, you know, and, and about halfway, they all came together. Um, but in the synopsis, I was struggling with that at the beginning, because I was like, okay, so in this chapter, we move back to Strix, and what am I going to do now? But I think it's important to know that in the synopsis you choose one character that you follow along the synopsis, but you obviously, uh, yeah, can tell I, more I, about that. I agree and disagree with that. I think, you know, in terms of your manuscript, that worked. Mm -hmm. um, because your main character, it was still very much about his story. Mm -hmm. Even if you had the other POVs coming in. Um, so you could tell the synopsis strictly from his POV. What you should do is mentioned that the story is multiple POV somewhere. So in the beginning of the synopsis say, told from the perspective of multiple characters, main character, yada, 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 and go from there. Um, so that the agent knows that, okay, there is going to be more than one point of view. However, for the sake of the plot, this is the POV I'm getting right now. And this tells the agent, this is the main character. So then when they're reading the manuscript, they know that. Take Game of Thrones. We'll throw that one right mm -hmm. out there. And the Perfect. 30 POV that George Martin has for Game of Thrones. It can be argued that, you know, Jon Snow, Arya Stark, um, Daenerys Targaryen, all of them are main characters. Yes. <sighs> That one's very tricky, and I have seen synopses where we get a sort of the character's name in bold, and then kind of, uh, you know, what they're doing throughout the story, and then we get the next character and what they're doing, and how they all play into sort of that main conflict and resolution. 
So I have seen them written like that. It, it does get a little confusing at times if it's not done well. Um, but if you really do have a story where there are three main characters and it's not, um, I, you know, I have edited a book um, and a synopsis where there were two main characters and the synopsis was rich, written such that the first paragraph was one character, the second was the other. Um, I've seen them split half and half where the first half of the synopsis is one character, the second. Yeah. Um, so there are different ways to do that. Yeah. You just have to remember, you have to be able to portray this whole story um, in three pages or less mm -hmm. with multiple characters. So keep it very clean, very concise yeah. of what these characters are doing and um, what the end goal is. Here's another tip about the synopsis with an agent. They don't care if you spoil the ending. That is what the yeah. synopsis is for. Don't try to surprise your agent with the with the synopsis. Don't allude to something else is going to happen. They want to know what the story is about. Don't try to hide under spoiler, um, you know, uh, or hooks or anything like that. Don't mm -hmm. a synopsis is not necessarily supposed to hook the agent. That's what the query letter is for. Yeah. The synopsis is supposed to tell them what the story is end of um and i have read synopses where they're you know there's a mythical creature and they're gonna have this higher power no i want to know that the mythical creature is a hydra and they're gonna drink from the cauldron of life and then their higher power is that they get to be the guru guy of the of the you know of the lake and then they're gonna destroy the world give the spoilers yeah. um <laughs> you need to know what the story is about yeah. um on the other hand though if i may you spoilers are very good but um too much description is killer for synopsis. Mm -hmm. like i don't need to know if your character has red hair or black hair or blue eyes right. unless right. it is very important to the plot but it right. hardly ever is so there is a very um tight balance between you know leaving out and putting in there so right. it, it's interesting so, so let's let's revert to um a children's book um dr seuss and the star-bellied sneetches um, so there you are getting into description, but the description of the characters, the Sneetches, is very important because some have stars on their bellies and some don't. Um, so then you're getting into a character description where that description is integral to the story because exactly. it, it drives the plot and it also contributes to the conflict. So, yeah. um, yes, if your character's red hair is that, you know, the chosen one with the red hair from the prophecy or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> then it is okay to, to add that yeah. little detail in there. So they're they're tricky, but just remember that they are very much a summary of what your book is. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about pitch lines or log lines or something like that, they're asking you to summarize an entire book in one sentence. Think of your synopsis as a good way to say, you know what, this is what my book is about. And I have three pages to do it. Yeah. Um, because that is a lot easier to have those three pages to work with than one sentence, um, you know, or an elevator pitch where you have one minute to tell an agent, this is what my book is about, and and this character, and you did it, and the agent's just like, okay, and the conflict is, Going? Yeah, and, exactly. and you know, and, and the book is about, and this is your time to shine, um, yeah. you know, so make your little grocery list synopsis, go from aisle to aisle, chapter to chapter, tell us what it is about. Now, the last sort of bit that I can give, I guess, um, from the intern's perspective um, and looking at agents and querying agents myself, some agents want the synopsis, some do not. Um, and you really need to be aware of what the agent's preference is, read their submission guidelines. Um, some agents, you know, they'll read the synopsis before they'll even touch the pages because if they recognize that this is not a book that they're going to be interested in, they're not going to waste their time. Some want the writing to speak first, and so they don't want the synopsis as all. Well. I have queried both. I have seen both. Um, so just be very aware in the submission guidelines what the agent is looking for. Um, paste it where it needs to be pasted. If an agent tells you, I want your first 10 pages, mm -hmm. and then your synopsis, or I want your query letter, then your synopsis, then your first 10 pages, make sure that you're formatting your query email um, how they want that formatted. Yeah. Um, this all goes back to your pre previous episodes where you did um, quite a, you did an intern insights on how to find out you know what a, what an agent wants. So I'll be sure to put a link on that um, in the corner of the screen. And I still don't remember if it's that corner or that corner. 
but it's going to be there. <laughs> this week's Twitter poll asked what subject people were most eager to hear about. And we gave you three choices. How to use a word spider, crutch words versus passive voice, and characters using crutch words. Now, the most popular subject coming from the community was actually a draw this time. So for this episode, we're going to focus on characters using crutch words, and I'll be posting a shorter video on how to use the word spider later this week. So if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, now is your moment to make sure you won't miss it. Now, I personally like the result of the poll this week, because we all know that the way someone speaks and talks helps build a character and it creates layers and it creates depth but it makes them real and relatable because we can recognize the way they speak but what if a character uses a lot of crutch words or filler words in the way you know that per that character actually talks um lydia do you have some thoughts on this actually i do um i'm gonna put myself on the chopping block here i remember the first book that i wrote and published i i should say published because there are a few that are um they're unmentionable. Um, one of my character's crutch words was although. Although I wanted to do this, I went and did that instead. And although you're being such a pain in the ass, you know, I'm, I'm going to trust you on this. So it it's one that when I look back at that book now, um, it, it makes me cringe because that, that was that character's favorite word, although or though. Um, and it was definitely a crutch word. And it's one now that is on my little list on the wall. And I don't let any of my characters say it. <laughs> um, so yes, um, characters definitely use crutch words as well. And I think that translates a little bit back from what we were talking about earlier. And we bring our own into the character. And that is because um, we are the voice of the character. So, um, and at the same time, the character is its own voice and we're listening to that voice. Um, characters come alive. Um, and they come alive on the page and that's the whole point of writing a story is, you know, character driven and things like that. So a character's voice might be very different from how we speak, um, but they may have their own crush words. Uh, you know, um, mine is the word but and I use the word but in everything when I talk to people or like, um, you know, but I could have a 90 year old uh, redneck man who, who, you know, lives in the backwoods of Maine and shoots turkeys and has a dog named Bubba and um, his favorite word is yeah which is a common main uh, colloquialism <laughs> so characters are going to have their own words that they fall back on so we need to be aware that characters are going to develop those crutch words as well um, and those are not necessarily filler words those are crutch words for the characters so we were talking about some of the filler words being just, yet, but, and, that. Um, those are filler. Crutch yeah. words are those words that your character uses all the time. Um, yeah. I so, think it, it, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, well, I was just going to say that they're they're different from, from a crutch word. Yeah, I think um, if you use those kind of words in the story, it's actually a very nice moment to just for a second look at the word spider because I learned that technique once and I'm going to just very quickly explain what it is. A word spider is basically putting a circle around one of the crutch words. Um, and if in that paragraph you can connect that circle to at least six of, other, uh, of, of the same words, then you have a bug. So then it's bugging you. So if you have that word six times in a paragraph, it's, it's already meh. If you have eight of them, and it becomes a spider, then it's just way too much. It's yeah. way too many times, uh, you know, you've used that word. So um, I think editing wise, um, you can you can definitely have a character use their own crutch words, um, but there are two conditions. The first one is that needs to be very clear that that is the character's voice. So your own writing as a narrator needs to be clean. It needs to be super clean so that the contrast between what the character is saying and what you are writing as a writer, you know, is very clear. And the second condition is if you use that word spider, it cannot be more than six per paragraph. And that's already kind of a lot. So, yeah, I, it's it's a very interesting thought. I, actually. 
I would agree with you on, on that, except the six, um, as a developmental editor, I would notice that and I would tell you cut it down by half um, okay. so that there are only three of those correct words in a paragraph because six is a lot in, mm -hmm. in one paragraph of the same word. Um, I remember one of mine was smiled. So this is sort of getting away from what characters are saying and describing describing characters. And I think one of the things we need to talk about is as writers, we can develop crutches, things that we lean on mm -hmm. um, with characters and description, what they look like. Yours, for example, is scream, mine is smile. My character's always smiling. I'm like, they're so fucking happy. <laughs> um, so, and I remember getting an edit back and, and there was six instances of the word smile in the in the paragraph yeah. and I put it down yeah. to two because it was so much. Um, yeah, exactly. That's why, why I said like six is, it's yeah. bugging. It's a bug. So it's, take it it's out. A yeah. lot. So, you know, um, another common one that I see at characters who shrug their shoulders, um, yeah. characters sigh. They're always sighing. Characters who run their hands through their hair when they're frustrated. Those are a lot of common crutch descriptions, yeah. which they're not, they're, they're, they could be more than just a word, and it could be a description that you're always falling back on. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to be very careful um, to, to make sure um, that you're not falling back on, on describing. Yeah. Um, and oh, do you I think, talk, oh, sorry. I, I talk with my hands, I wring my hands together. So. <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> that's, is that a crutch? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so we, yeah, we, uh, as writers, we have a responsibility to to not only separate narrator voice from character voice, mm -hmm. and to make sure both are clean, and to make sure that the um, the writing isn't becoming too cluttered um, with those filler words and with those crutch words. Um, and that is again revision, 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 yeah. recognizing your vices and cr well, crutches, your cinnamon words. Um, and recognizing, uh, you know, the, the characters. Um, so separate, if you have to do multiple rounds of re revision where you're looking at your crutch words from the narrator's perspective, mm -hmm. and then looking at the crutch words and the filler words of the um, character's perspective, you know, do that. Yeah, um, yeah and that's I not even that an it. if you have to, that's like a you have to. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely do my revising um, in rounds and um, look for, look mm -hmm. for those. Yeah. They are a micro edit. Although it seems like a gigantuan, ta gigantic. Mm -hmm. What is that word? What's that word I'm looking for? Huge. Big. Yeah. It's just large. It's really big. Yeah, <laughs> we all synonyms I, for big. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't synonyms. Synonym, synonym. I can't English today. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yes, it's. It seems like a really big task to have to to look at every instance of the word that, which appears well over a thousand times in a hundred thousand word manuscript. Um, it's necessary. Yes. It's absolutely 100% yeah. necessary to take the time and look at every instance. I've, I've seen people say on Twitter, for example, that they rarely edit and that they, they are winging the book. Yeah, that was exactly my response. And, 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 you know, at this point, maybe they do sell books. I, I have no idea, but I do not believe in writers that do not have to edit their books. I am so sorry, no. but that's, that, no. <laughs> that's, that's, I, I, that hurts my editor heart. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, I can, yeah. Yeah. Um. I, that I I don't like to judge others, but to me, as a writer, as an editor, that seems irresponsible. Um. You no writer is your own work in the first place. I mean, that that alone is a reason to start editing because you do not see your own mistakes. Right. I think if if you're writing something for yourself and mm -hmm. the world is never going to see it, if you don't want to edit that piece, fine. That's, you know, that's your prerogative. I think we have a responsibility as writers. We are, this is still a business. We are still selling a product yeah. and we don't want to be selling, you know, something that's, that's subpar. And Anytime somebody points out to me a grammatical error in one of my books, it just, it makes me cringe because I want you to have the best product I can give you. And I know I'm not perfect. No writer is. And so I do, you know, the, the opposite end of that spectrum. I mm -hmm. can't stand seeing people just tear writers apart because they have a handful of grammatical errors in a book um, that really winds me up. 
I do think that any writer that says, I don't need to edit a book, and they just go ahead and publish it without, that's irresponsible. And, yeah. and I will stand on that, and maybe I'm going to get some flack from this, but um, it, it just speaks to the integrity of the mm. piece and the writing um, to, to be able to say, you know what, there is always room for improvement. And I think as writers, that's what we're yeah. always trying to do is we're trying to bring the next best piece, um, mm -hmm. the next best piece of work, the next, um, yeah, that would hurt. <laughs> no, I totally get that. I I, I, I like the word. I, I, I really like the word responsibility in here because, you know, even if we go back to the subject, if your character uses a lot of crud words, you are not taking responsibility on what that character is saying. So I, I, I think you can even say that at that point, you, you don't own your work. Like you, you need to be the master of your work. And if the characters just walk away with you and you're going to let them, because that's basically what characters do. I mean, yes, they come alive in a way and they can, they can take you everywhere also into places where they can just unlimitedly use their crutch words. And mm -hmm. I, I think we need to, yeah, keep an eye out on that. Keep definitely. On check. Don't let your characters bully you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> but maybe they do that in your head, you know, before you sit down and write the page. And Lord knows how many times I've had an MC, you know, I'm taking a shower or something like that. And they're like, hey! <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't let them do that on the page. Do not let them run away with, with the words. Um, the story, maybe. Your characters can always surprise you. And oh, that's yeah. a whole panther versus plotter. I do that all the time. But, um, <laughs> you know, and you will hear in revising, you know, that a character has taken over the page in this story. It just doesn't make sense anymore. And that's a whole other episode we can mm -hmm. talk about. But yes. <laughs> in terms of crutch words and filler words, yes, it is quite possible for your character to kind of muscle their way in and do their own thing. And then... It is your responsibility as a writer to go back and, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. fix that. Well said. Well, that's it again for today. Thank you so much for tuning into the Red Ink Writers podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, please leave a comment below in the descriptions. Um, be sure to subscribe because, you know, if you hit that bell button, you will never miss another episode again. Next episode, we will have a new uh, Twitter poll ready for you and we will we'll be talking about, and here we come, I have to peek on my screen again. We are going to talk about judging books by their cover. Until that time, you've got this, even if you don't know what the fuck you're doing.